Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. In our previous episode, Dr. Paul Kangor of Grove City College joined us to talk about his book, The Devil and Karl Marx, Communism's Long March of Death, Deception, and Infiltration. Today, my good friend and co-host, Scott Lancer, joins me here in the studio for a follow-up discussion about Marx's ideology and its pernicious impact on the Western culture and the church. Well, Scott, it's good to see you here on the, on the set of Digging for Truth. Nice to be with you, Henry. It's been a while since you've been here. It has, yes. How are you doing? Are you feeling well? I'm feeling well, yep. All right. Well, are we ready to roll? Uh, all set. All right. Well, uh, our last episode was a, was a pretty... Well, it was a pretty dark subject. Yes. We talk, I talked with Dr. Kangor about Marxism, uh, about its history, about Marx the man, his fascination with the devil and so on. But you and I thought, you know, we need to connect this up some more. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kangor did that in a previous episode. We, yes. want, we want folks to go back and watch that. Um, but we want to connect this up some more to the present day, That's Mar right. Marxism. Um, so let's talk about the issue of sort of Christianity and Marxism from the big picture perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to have a discussion about that. So let's talk about in Marxism this oppressor, oppressor and oppressed dynamic and how that applies today. Just yeah. start there. Yeah, well, we are dealing today with uh, manifestations of this uh, root, these root ideas that are based in a worldview that our, our, our conflict in the world is between uh, oppressors and the oppressed and the ideologies that come out of that. And so uh, that's, you know, we see it in Black Lives Matter. We see it in other other manifestations. But this fundamental idea uh, as, par as part of we're going to define critical theory and what that is, but it comes out of critical theory. So this worldview, critical theory and its manifestations are a challenge to our faith, challenge to the Bible, challenge to what Christians believe. Yeah, that's a good intro, Scott. The, you know, the, the Marxism in its classic form was um, the worker versus the people who owned capital. And that was sort of, it was an economic idea, but it was more than that because they wanted to change the whole world. They wanted right. to tear down society and rebuild it in their own image. That's right. Um, but you know the economics was sort of the of the dimension of that. But today, what we have is an expansion of that into relate all kinds of relationships. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe talk a little bit about like what we're what we're seeing in terms of of groups of people who are sort of being pitted against one another mm -hmm. uh, in oppressor and oppressed categories. Maybe we could talk about that a little. Right, right. Well, this is the, the, the cultural Marxism, the uh, going from, you know, everybody somewhere along the line should have learned what classical uh, Marxist uh, thought was. Now, yes. I, I can't assume that anymore because I talk to too many young people who have really no idea about what this is all about. But the, in responding to your specific question, we've got various uh, groups that are being pitted against one another within this cultural Marxist uh, philosophy ideology. Uh, certainly, the, some of the more obvious ones would be men versus women, right? Um, uh, we certainly see it in the, the, the uh, homosexual versus heterosexual dynamic, black versus white, uh, white people versus all minority groups and even children being pitted against their parents in this dynamic. Yes. Um, so, so a couple of thing, a couple of the things that that we we see happening here in this idea, um, uh, what we we're calling cultural Marxism. So, it's the idea of Marx, groups, oppressed oppressor pitted against each other, reducing human relationships and motives to power. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk a little bit about like that idea mm -hmm. that e everything is about power. This is some of the Nietzsche talked about this and and uh, other postmodern philosophers have talked about everything is about power dynamics. Let's right. talk about how antithetical to the gospel that whole idea is. Yeah. Well, when you when you make everything about power struggles, you're missing the biblical target which is talking about 
how the, uh, that, that the problem with human beings is a problem we call sin. Yes. Now, now you can have people who are abusing power, right? But that's a manifestation of the fact that they're sinners. Yes. Uh, Any time you have oppression, and and it's very important for us to emphasize to to all our viewers today that we understand the realities of oppression and the misuse of power, but this. Um, this critical theory, this, this concept is that uh, power and the misuse of it is the, is the center, is the center of the problem. And so you, yes. must, you must change that dynamic. And there's, there's a whole set of uh, ways to do that within critical theory. Um, but the bottom line is this definition of power being the issue misses the mark biblically. And of course, I guess we can talk about this, Henry, but you know, uh, for, for many who have embraced critical theory, they are looking at this and saying, well, you're using the Bible and you're not allowed to use the Bible. That is right. what they would call a, um, a meta narrative. This would be something uh, that you need to remove. You can't appeal to it because it's part of the oppressive system. Yes, yes. And so we can't, for them, we can't talk about it. Uh, but the reality is we must talk about it. Yes. And uh, because we're calling into question the very ideas that they're putting forth in this regard. Yeah, that's a really good good summary. I mean, and you know, to to also say that the Bible is some kind of Western construct because usually it's Western civilization that's yes. under attack here yeah. is also is false from the beginning because the Bible came out of uh, Israel, yes, right. And so so that's not Western; uh, it's Eastern. Right. Uh, so you know, there's sort of an irony there. The other part of this, uh, as we wind down this first segment, is sort of the the notion of these power dynamics being between people. Um, as if that's the only way they relate to each other. Right. Like think about like our relationship. We're, we're really, what's going on between us is a power play mm -hmm. all the time. Imagine if that was really the characteristic of our friendship right. uh, in all human relationships. It's, it's quite hideous. Yes, it is. It is uh, a misunderstanding of the dynamics of human nature and how human beings interrelate with one another. Um, and of course, this gets very developed and very complex in places. Yes. But fundamentally, we, people need to understand that there is a fatal flaw in, at, at the center of this worldview that we as Christians fully reject. Yeah, and certainly incompatible with the gospel. So friends, uh, Scott Lancer and I are talking about really Marxism, cultural Marxism, how it's worked its way into our culture, how it's created uh, great conflict, and how it's antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll be back right after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archeological field work and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures for students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Scott Lancer, my friend and co-host, and we're talking about cultural Marxism, uh, reducing human relationships to power dynamics and how this has worked its way out in our culture. So Scott, one of the, one of the major problems that you and I see with the way this works out is, okay, we have groups, two groups, oppressors and the oppressed. And so what the oppressed is taught in this system is they have to overthrow the oppressor. And there's sort of this idea that the oppressor has to be overthrown. Now there's a lot of problems with that, but one of them that I've noticed that is antithetical to the gospel is there's no doctrine of forgiveness right. built into this. Right. Why don't we talk about that a little bit? Because it's so important, this is center to what Christ taught us. 
That's right, because if you have, if you can line your ducks up in a row here and you, you, you are identified as an oppressed individual, you are allowed to basically demonize those who are your oppressors. They are to be, you know, they're to be written off. You know, there's all sorts of things we're seeing, you know. Uh, we're seeing uh, people who are erasing the views of others, uh, silencing. We see that in social media. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Canceling people. Canceling yeah. people. So that's going on. So basically, I don't have to talk to you. You're the oppressor. And I have a special uh, right to do this as an oppressed person. And again, you go through your categories. And this is where we get this, uh, what's called uh, the in intersectional uh, approach to this where you say, okay, I'm this minority, I'm this sex, I'm, I have this sexual orientation. And you can really, you know, set yourself up as a, a really oppressed person. Right. And so uh, this, this whole idea of the cancel culture, the fact that once I've demonized you, once I've condemned you as an oppressor, uh, there is no forgiveness. You must be basically erased. And uh, that is somehow going to bring about an equaling of this power issue. Of course, you know, it's convoluted. Yeah, you know, and I don't, I don't want to under, um, understate or underestimate yes. uh, genuine oppression and what it does to a person. That's okay. Right. That's so right. what, I'm not, what I'm not saying here is... Uh, you've been mistreated in a horrific way. Mm -hmm. You need to forgive and sort of in a, in a sort of lording over kind of way. Yeah. It's not what I'm saying. God has to empower people to have true forgiveness. That's right. Okay. But the gospel says that if you've been mistreated, if you're a Christian, a doctrine of forgiveness is embedded in the gospel. And That's this right. worldview is the exact opposite of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Forgiveness is difficult. That's the point. That's right. And that's why Jesus came in the world. In fact, he said something so radical that no one else has really said. He said, love your enemies. Yes. Yes. And it's ironic, like as part of, of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, I, you've prob everyone's probably seen them, the little placards that say, love thy neighbor. Yes. But that is not what their theory promotes. And I find it interesting. You'll see these signs, especially in Christian uh, uh, Christian cultures, little yeah. microcultures like yeah. where I live, um, where you'll see these signs go up. But the truth is, if you're consistent with a critical theory, uh, critical race theory, right, the, the, the more defined, uh, you, you're going to understand that you are actually not to love your neighbor, you're to hate that person. That is a strange twisting of the gospel. It's obviously, it's a, it's a denial of the gospel. Right where Christ said to love your neighbor, to love and pray for your enemies. So that is lost in this, in this, uh, in this worldview. Yeah, you know, and, and it ties into some other terms that we hear, Scott. We want to expand our conversation a little bit here. Yeah. So we're talking about, in some ways, oppress, oppressor and oppressed power dynamics. We're talking yes. about the, the concept of justice. Right. And this brings in the whole idea of what we call, what's called social justice, but mm -hmm. it's really based on this whole oppressor oppressed dynamic. Right. So let's, let's, let's compare that idea, that sort of a dynamic to biblical justice. Maybe you could right. talk about that a little bit. Right, well, it's important for our viewers to understand. I, I'm using a phrase, critical theory. Yes. That critical theory, that's, that's, the, that's the name of what we're describing here, oppressor, and oppressed and that whole dynamic. Now, social justice fits into this whole discussion. Um, many times Christians hear social justice and they go, they're thinking biblical justice. But uh, so it appeals to them in some way it, it because does. of the terminology. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. So it, it appeals to them. And in, and in some loose definition, you can say that Christians affirm social justice. But a better phrase would be to use, uh, it would be better to use the phrase biblical justice, yeah. which has a completely different definition for justice. Social justice is rooted in 
critical theory, which is how to balance and, and set right the oppressor oppressed dynamic. That's the motivation for it. Right. Uh, we have to get back to the Bible. I know there's some really important verses that underline that. Well, I think, I think we can sum up this segment, Scott. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, about something we were talking about before as we were preparing, and that is these, uh, the, the theory breaks people up into two categories, oppressor and oppressed, but that's not what the Bible does. Maybe talk about that as a, as a launching point for the justice sure. issue. What yeah. categories are people in according to God? Yeah, there, the Bible uh, tell, tells us that God created us in his image. So that's universal. That's all human beings. And that all have fallen in sin. We've, we, are, we are sinful in Adam and we are sinners. That's universal. The issue in the Bible is that sin is the problem. Sin leads to the abuse of power. Sin leads to uh, oppress, oppression of others. Sin leads to racism. Sin leads to theft. Sin leads to envy. Sin is the problem. The revenge. issue is uh, revenge. Yep. Sin is the issue. And because that is misunderstood, then so, the, the definition of social justice gets twisted and we, are, we fall outside of the biblical structure and teaching. Yeah, that, that's really an excellent, uh, excellent wrapping up of that. Well, friends, thank you for joining us today for Digging for Truth. We're talking about uh, cultural Marxism, how the ideas of Karl Marx have worked its way into our society and the dangers that this uh, gives to the church. And we'll be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Scott Lancer. We're talking about cultural Marxism and the effect it's having on our culture, and we're explaining it to you, our audience, so hopefully you'll understand a little bit better. So, Scott, um, let, let's talk about this idea of, of who the oppressor is. So people are put into these categories, right? We talked before, white, black, man, woman, children, parents, all this kind of thing. Uh, according to this critical theory, you and I have no right to even have this conversation. Yes. because That we what we're are, saying is completely illegitimate and doesn't need to be listened to. We are oppressors within this system. Right. Uh, because we're male and we're white and et cetera. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's really terrible, a terrible uh, way of looking at, at human beings. Yes. And yes. Uh, it's actually... Um, it's dreadful because the things that, that, that they, the ideas that people will use to make these judgments are a revelation of the very thing that they decry. So it's a, an example of it. Um, you know, I was thinking, Henry, people who are watching today, we had talked about there's a generational shift or generational perspective problem. Many people, let's just, just to throw out a, a, an age, we'll say over the age of 40, yes. okay? They, they see these things from a particular perspective. Many times those under 40 uh, are seeing these matters wildly differently, and they've actually been affected and bought into some of this, uh, some of these, uh, some of this philosophy. Yeah, you know, uh, we, we talked about in our preparation this, this, this idea of, so when I mentioned that you and I don't even have the right to have this conversation, there's a reason why, because we're in the oppressor category. So it's really, you know, not, I'm not, you know, I'm not a victim here, but I'm just saying that's how I, you and I would be seen. Yeah. Uh, it's completely dehumanizing. It yes. says that your voice, your analysis, your evaluation of the situation is completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody who agrees with your perspective is also irrelevant. So if you're, a, say, a black person, 
but you agree with what we're arguing. You've uh, internalized this oppressor uh, idea, and therefore you're part of the problem. That's so it's right. a very strange kind of thing. Um, now, shifting gears a little, Scott, because we talked a little bit about also about if you put yourself in this category of the oppressor, of the oppressed, the oppressor can't speak into it right. unless he's somehow enlightened. Let's talk about that dimension of this worldview. Yeah, well, uh, to be enlightened means you're going to uh, have to make major changes in your life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, um, you have to accept fully this worldview in order to get with the program, to, to use the uh, uh, popular phrase, right? Yes. Get with yes, the program. And if you don't get with the program, the goal is to, well, to take any steps that are necessary to, to make equality uh, real. And, of course, that can mean... Destruction, violence, uh, theft. Yes, all kinds of things. Right. I mean, it, it, to, to make this right, anything is allowable because we are fixing the problem. And of course, it's so convoluted and turned around. So this is why you see people in the name. It's like, it's like when we think of Antifa, for instance, yes. anti, anti-fascism or anti-fascist, yes. whatever. Um, they are the living example of what fascists do, yes. but it's all, it's all okay because they're addressing this larger issue of getting rid of the oppressors. So now to make things even more complicated, because now you've added another dimension into it, the justification of the unleashing of sin, mm -hmm. violence, vile language towards your fellow man, unforgiveness, revenge, envy all this stuff is just unleashed yes. on the oppressor or the structure of society in addition to that we have anybody who critiques it is using a construct of the oppressor so if i use reason logic statistics logical argumentation all of that is the construct of the oppressor what That's do you think right. about that? Yeah, well, see, what, what that does, of course, is it means we can't be having this conversation. We can't use facts. We can't use logical argumentation. Now, th they can if they want to. Right. Because they're in this other class. It's sort of an, right. they have enlightened reason and we don't. Right. If you, it's almost religious, isn't it? That's right. That's right. So um, this is why people relate this kind of thinking to Gnosticism. Uh, they have they have in the enlightened view because they've been oppressed and thus they have true enlightenment through life experience and you or wh whoever is in the oppressor role, they have had this, uh, you know, they have this better place platform uh, and that needs to be changed because the person who's lived through oppression, they actually have the secret insight as to how to correct this problem. How to correct it. And that entails tearing down Western civilization and its That's structures right. and rebuilding it in their own image. Right. Sort of a recreation. That's another, it's another religious dimension to all this. Yes. All right, Scott, I'm going to give you the very difficult task of wrapping up in one minute, appealing to young people. Young people yeah. that you talk to that genuinely care about other people, but have been pulled into this construct thinking that it's just. Yeah, it's, it's really hard sometimes having conversations because um, the, they, they have bought into the worldview of critical theory. They bought into that worldview. And once they're there, they can't get out of it. Because it's like it, a cult. It, it's yes, it's it's like a cult, a cultic structure, and it's dangerous from it's spiritually dangerous. This is why people have gotten a little upset with me at times. I call social justice uh, a, a heresy when it's misunderstood. These ideas, all of these ideas, are dangerous, and we need to get back to the Bible.
we have to get back to the Bible. Yeah, I think that's a good way to end the show. Uh, thank you, Scott. It's good to see you again and good to be in the studio with you again, talking about an immense subject and a difficult one. Yes. Thank you for sharing your insights. Friends, we want to encourage you to pray for the church. Pray for our country. Pray for Western society. These pernicious ideas are destroying the very fabric of our culture. They're infiltrating the church. And we have to fight them spiritually because they're destructive and will destroy um, human well-being and the church itself if we're not very vigilant. We thank you for joining us today for this episode of Digging for Truth.